I don't mind falling in front of a live audience, but when it's streamed down over the internet to places like China, you know, I, I just, I'd rather not. So, we are glad that you're here this morning. If you are new to Mountain View, this is your first time. I know for some of you it is. Uh, this is your first time in this building. Uh, we are especially glad that you are here this morning. Uh, we love your presence. We are honored by it. Uh, we say this a lot here at Mountain View, that we live in a great place in this country. And there's a lot of things that you could do on a Sunday morning, on a long weekend. Uh, and so we just really appreciate and take, do not take for granted uh, the fact that you're here this morning. If you're a part of our Mountain View family, we'd love to see you each and every weekend. We believe some great things happen when God's people gather to worship. And so we're glad that you're here. We are wrapping up our series on Jonah uh, this morning. We've been four weeks going through four chapters of Jonah, looking at the story of God working through Jonah to bring revival to the Ninevites. And yet the story of Jonah is not just the story of one man, uh, not even the story of one city. Uh, it is the story of the people of God. What God has called his, his people from the Israelites to the church to be, uh, which is a light to the world, a city on a hill. And we've been looking at the lens, the lens of Jonah, of what that means today. So we're glad that you're here. Many of you are familiar with a fellow by the name of Max Licato. Uh, perhaps you have a devotional book of his, one of 400 I think he's written. He's written a lot of different devotional books. The man has sold millions and millions of copies. And he's been writing really since the late 80s, on up until present. And he tells in one of his books the story of when he had an irregular heartbeat. It was so bad, in fact, it concerned the doctor so much that they decided to do an operation to kind of help bring it back into rhythm. And so they had a scheduled what they called a catheter ablation. A catheter ablation. In layman's terms, what that means is that they stick two things into your heart. One is a camera. So they can see what they're doing, which is always a good idea. And, and the second thing is the ablation tool. Anybody familiar with what ablation means? It means fire. You know, it, it means burning. It means they're going to go in and singe parts of his heart. Or as he described it, they're going to brand me for God. You know, on the inside of, of my heart. And so as the doctor is describing this process, he says to Lakeda, he says, here's what's going to happen. We're going to put this camera in, we're going to steer it, and then the ablation tool is going to come in, and it is going to burn off all of the misbehaving parts of your heart. Of course, Lakato being a pastor and a writer and all those, he says, can I ask a question? He says, sure. He says, while you're in there, is it possible you could burn off like the selfish parts of me too? You know, and, and burn, burn off the greedy parts? He goes, it doesn't work that way, Mr. Lakato. It doesn't work that way. He says, it is above my pay grade. Well, Akato points out in his book, it may be above the pay grade of a doctor to change the true nature of a person, but it is not above the pay grade of God. In fact, that is the story of God. From the beginning of Adam and Eve through the end of the Bible and Revelation, from our time forward till Jesus comes back. That the story of God is that God has been in the transformation. That what medicine can't do, what science can't do, what willpower can't do, that God does. And that's the story that we find in Jonah. And so I know many of you have your Bibles this morning. Uh, we're going to be at the end of chapter 3, which Phil covered so fantastically last weekend. And then we're going to go into chapter 4, and we'll finish out the book. But if you want to start with me, Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. When God saw what they did, and they is the Ninevites, the city of Nineveh, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. If you remember, the story of Jonah begins with the call of God to Jonah to go and to preach against the wickedness of Nineveh, this great pagan city uh, that's far from God, that God sends Jonah to preach against the wickedness of Nineveh Jonah runs the other way, chapter 1, comes back to God slightly in chapter 2. In chapter 3, he goes. And he preaches that eight-word sermon, essentially saying, you better turn things around or God's going to step in and make things right. And the whole city repented. And so verse 10 of chapter 3 says, when God saw what they did, when the Ninevites believed the message of Jonah and began to change, that God relented. And he did not bring the destruction he had threatened. 
There, there are some people in the Christian world that this particular verse actually makes uncomfortable. And it's the idea that God can change his mind. There are some folks who have kind of this fixed idea of God, that, uh, that, that God is kind of set on something, everything is preordained and pre, you know, kind of presupposed and pre, predestined. This verse tells us that God is elective. That means literally he changed his mind. And as Phil brought out last week and as we talked over at Inglewood, all of us are beneficiaries of the fact that God changes his mind. That means God is gracious towards us. And so he doesn't bring upon them the destruction he has threatened. And so how would you expect Jonah to respond? Here's Jonah, this reluctant prophet, who runs the other way. God gives a second chance. He goes into one of the hardest cities possible, this pagan city of Nineveh. And he preaches an eight-word sermon, and the entire city turns around and flips and repents. You know, if I'm Jonah, and, and, and I'm the pastor that God sends into Nineveh, and, and I have this great response. I'm waiting for my trophy. That, that, that's what I'm waiting for. You know, I, I'm waiting for my trophy, kind of my certificate, my plaque to hang on the wall. You know, that Jonah was faithful, follow God, and the whole city of Nineveh was changed. How does Jonah respond? Notice the first verse of chapter 4. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. This is one of these word pictures in scripture uh, that is just priceless. It really is. It's just priceless. You know, the, 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 this one is just, is just great. You know, here's Jonah. He goes to Nineveh, one of the hardest possible cities, and he reaches them. His message gets through. The Holy Spirit interacts with the Ninevites. They turn to God. And Jonah thinks it's wrong. Now, just let that word sink in on you for a moment. Just think about that word wrong. What does the word wrong mean? Don't, don't overcomplicate this, okay? Don't, don't over-spiritualize it. Don't look for some deeper hidden theological meaning. But what does the word wrong mean? It's not right. That, 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 that's what the word wrong means. Jonah is looking at what happened. He's thinking, God, this isn't right. You shouldn't have done this. This is wrong. Have you ever felt like God is wrong. It's okay. You would not be the first person to ever have a quibble with God, to ever have a debate with God, to even take the opposite side of God. And you don't have to be a pagan to do that. You can be a Jewish prophet like Jonah. Ever felt like God's asking you to do something? And often it's what is uncomfortable and because if something makes us uncomfortable, it can't be what? Right. And so therefore, who must be wrong? God. Jonah's not the first person, not the last person to think God was wrong. But this last image of Jonah, just picture it. He's been faithful, even though he's still prejudiced. He goes and he preaches a successful message. He thinks God was wrong to do it, and it makes him angry. Just picture that for a moment. Here are the Ninevites who have responded positively to Jonah's message. And he's angry about it. He's angry. In fact, this anger of Jonah uh, is going to bring about a response from God. But, but one of the ways you can think of Jonah at this point is that Jonah's heart is like a metal bar. It's hard and it is unmelted. He has gone and preached and he's not been changed. The Ninevites were changed. And so this gets the attention of God. And before we get to God's response, uh, let me maybe help you understand the, the thought process of Jonah as it relates to those of us who follow Jesus. Uh, I call it Christianity 1.0 and 2.0. So you have Christianity 1.0. Uh, this is not a non-believer. This is not a person on a search. Uh, this is someone who's come to faith in Jesus, given their life to him, and they're learning what it means to follow Jesus. Oftentimes, Christianity 1.0 is simply we be obedient. We do what God asks us. We learn to surrender. We don't necessarily like it. In fact, uh, we probably don't love it. Because Christianity 1.0 is simply this initial process of having lived your whole life under a different system. 
call them your selfish system, your sinful nature. And, and you come to faith in Jesus, and now you're trying to learn a new system underneath the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and, and you're learning how to be obedient. Christianity 2.0 is when you go from just simply being obedient to be obedient, to learning to love. Not just loving what God asks you to do, but loving who God asks you to love. Jonah is stuck in version 1.0. How do we know that? Because Jonah had been obedient. There's no question about that. In chapter 1, he's disobedient. And then, you know, he runs from God. The sailors throw him overboard. God provides this fish. And he gives him a second chance inside the belly of the whale. Jonah begins to turn back to God. And chapter 3 begins, but the word of the Lord came a second time to Jonah. And Jonah goes. And he is obedient. He does what God asks him to do. But we know from his response in chapter 4 that the prejudice of Jonah had not changed. He didn't feel any different towards the Ninevites, no warm fuzzies towards them, you know, no graciousness whatsoever. He hasn't made it to 2.0. He's been obedient. He's been faithful. He's done what God's asked him to. He doesn't like it. And so God decides to have a conversation with Jonah. And so Jonah starts by praying. And here's the prayer of Jonah in verse 2, which gets a response from God. Jonah prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? Now notice this. That is, what I, that, that is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. Now, did you just catch what Jonah had done? I knew what you're going to do, God. And I was trying to help you out, actually. You know, I was actually trying to help you out, God. I was, I was trying to forestall this. That's, why, that's really why, God, I ran to Tarshish. It wasn't because I was disobedient and I really hate and loathe the Ninevites. But that's not why, God. You, you, mis you misunderstood that. He says, that's why I'm trying to help you out, God. And, and then he says, he says, I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, this is the end of his prayer, by the way. Now, Lord, take away my life for it is better for me to die than to live. Wow. <laughs> you know, that, that's all I can say to that. That's a little melodramatic there. You know, Jonah, you know, that's like over the top. You know, that, that's okay. Jonah just kind of dialed back, stepped back to the ledge. Jonah says, God, I am so angry about this. I think you were so wrong to do this. It would be better for me to just die. That's how upset I am. That's how angry Jonah is at God. Can you just picture that? But there are some, some scenes in Scripture where you just kind of use your imagination, kind of like a coloring book, and, and kind of just color in some of the pages. You're thinking, how in the world is this possible? How in the world is this possible? Jonah would be like this and, and get so bent out of shape and be so upset. And, and essentially what he is saying to God is, God, I knew you were going to do this anyway, so why did you bother to get me involved? That's what Jonah is saying to God. God, why did you drag me into this? You could have just done it with a wiggle of your nose, a snap of your finger. There, there's all kinds of ways, God, you could have done this. Why get me involved? Perhaps what Jonas also asked him. Scott, why would you save somebody like this? Anybody remember this fellow's picture? Mm -hmm. His name's Jeffrey Dahmer. When Jonah looked at the Ninevites, he saw a man... He saw men and women like Jeffrey Dahmer. Now, some of you weren't born yet when Je Jeffrey Dahmer was sentenced and went off to prison. When he actually went to trial, he was, he was convicted of murdering and dismembering 17 people that they knew of. In fact, he's one of the most notorious serial killers in American history. Because not only did he kill, dismember these victims, but in many cases he cannibalized. In fact, when the police raided his apartment and they opened up his refrigerator door, they found skulls in his refrigerator. Human skulls. The man was sick and twisted. And when Jonah looked at the Ninevites, he sees a man like Jeffrey Dahmer. 
God, why get me involved and why would you save somebody like that? The Ninevites. What some of you may not know is on May 10th, 1994, Jeffrey Dahmer was baptized in a federal prison. In fact, this is a really a, a sad statement on the state of the church. But Jeffrey Dahmer has started a Bible correspondence course with a fellow in Mississippi. And this fellow is walking him through the truth of the gospel and how God loves anyone and everyone. And Dahmer got to the place where he was ready. And he says, I'm ready to make my decision. I'm ready to be baptized. And the fellow in Mississippi tried to find a pastor around the prison who would go and visit him. And it took three tries find someone go to prison to visit Jeffrey Dahmer. The fellow went in, talked with him, and baptized him in prison. Six months after his baptism, he was beaten to death. When news got out that Dahmer had been beaten in prison and killed in prison, these are pre-internet days. These are the days when you had to watch television, you had to read the newspaper. When word got out that Jeffrey Dahmer had been killed in prison, people were pleased. There were comments like, he got what he deserved. Should have happened sooner. Somebody should have killed him in high school. And people were pleased. In fact, had God decided to wipe out the Ninevites, I imagine that would have made Jonah happy. Because God's other response made Jonah C.S. Lewis describes it this way. He says, here's what God does that really bothers us. God is always saving people I don't like. And he's saving them in a manner that I don't approve of. That's the nature of God. That he saves people that we don't like. And he often does so in a way that we wouldn't approve of. Before we get too hard on Jonah and say, how in the world could, could Jonah, a, a prophet of God, you know, who actually hears the voice of God speak through him, how, how could Jonah get so upset and so angry before we get so upset at Jonah? First place we start is by admitting that there's a bit of Jonah in each of us. Truth be told, we all can come up with our list of people with our list of people groups or places or ideologies or political parties or whichever it might be that if, if God asked our opinion and allowed us to vote, it'd be hard. It might be impossible for some of us to say yes. Jonah gets upset. Say, God, I knew you were going to do this anyway. Why did you drag me into this? And God responds. In fact, Jonah ends, the story of Jonah ends with God's response. He begins in verse 4. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Do you have any right to be upset? Before Jonah could answer, Jonah had gone out and he sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter and he sat in its shade and he waited to see what would happen to the city. Anybody else find that interesting? Anybody else? What's that really saying? Just, just read between the lines. Just, just, just fill in the gap. What, what is that really saying? Jonah goes out, he's sitting on a hill, and he's watching to see what will happen to this. What's he hoping is going to happen to the city? Success. What he's hoping is those Ninevites didn't really leave. <laughs> that they don't go all the way, that they stop short, and, and that God changes his mind a second time. <clears throat> That's what Jonah is actually hoping will happen. So he's out there, he's, he, he's watching what would happen to the city. Notice verse 6, then the Lord God provided, that's a word you'll see a lot in Jonah, a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head, to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy. That's sweet. That's just, that's just really nice, isn't it? You know, here Jonah's out in the bacon in the sun, and God provides a plant, and it gives him some shade, and Jonah's happy. And he totally misses what God has just said. 
that God has just modeled, you know, through Jonah's discomfort, what he has just done for Nineveh. And Jonah doesn't see it. He's just happy. You know, kind of got some relief from the shade, kind of, like, that. that's nice. You know, so Jonah's happy about the plan. Verse 7, but at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die, and he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And what does Jonah say? Yes. It is. I have every right to be angry. I have every right to be ticked off. It, it, it is absolutely my right to be upset. It is. Notice. And I'm so angry. I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant, though you do not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight, and it died overnight. And should I not have been concerned for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and there's also a whole lot of cattle, a lot of animals. Jonah misses what God's trying to teach him with the plan. But Jonah did nothing nothing to deserve the comfort of the plan. In the same way, when we truly understand the gospel of Jesus, none of us have done a single thing to deserve, to earn, to produce the favor of God. And Jonah, the second time when God asks him, do you have a right to be angry? This time, Jonah actually has enough gall to say yes. In fact, I'm so upset, I, I want to die. And then God closes the story of Jonah with a question. Did you notice how Jonah ends? It ends with a question. With no answer. In fact, unlike some other books of the Bible where a writer will write maybe you know, a few hundred years later retelling the story of what happened in the Old Testament, many scholars believe that the book of Jonah was written by God. Which makes it very interesting that, that Jonah would allow this question just kind of be the last word and just kind of hang out there. Which makes you wonder why. Why does he not answer the question? You know, God says, shouldn't I be concerned about this, this, this city of 120,000 people who, who can't tell their right hand from their left? And that doesn't mean they're ignorant. That's not what God's saying about the Ninevites. He's not saying, boy, those poor Ninevites, they're, they're so stupid. You know, they don't even know their right hand. That's not what God's saying. What he's saying is they have no moral compass. They have no way of determining what is right or what is wrong. They have a lot of confusion. And I created him, God says, the same way I created you, Jonah. And shouldn't you care? And there's no answer. Some believe it's because Jonah knows the answer is obvious. But I wonder. If the answer is so obvious, Some people believe the question is open-ended because it's an invitation to get invited into the story of God. Either way, the question deserves an answer. God says, shouldn't I care about this great city of Nineveh? For Jonah, he saw his sin and the Ninevites' sin in two different categories. They were really bad, and he wasn't that bad. They were adulterers, they were murderers, they skinned people alive. But what had Jonah done? He had flat out said no to God. How many of you have kids, grandkids? All right. How do you like it when you ask your kid to do something? And they just look you right in the eye. And they don't even try to lie. They, they, they don't even try to avoid it. You know, they just go, no. That's when you break out that this is going to hurt me more than you lying, you know? And it's like, okay, you know, this is, this is how we're going to handle it. 
How do you think God felt? And Jonah says no. When you read the story of Jonah, it raises some questions. And the questions that the story of Jonah raises are at an individual level. For you as a person of God who's trying to follow God and be faithful to God, and it raises questions for the people of God, in our case, the church. For Jonah, for the individual, I believe the question is obvious. Which do you care more about? Plants or people? Do you care about personal comfort or lost people? I did this with our staff a few weeks ago. We had a, a time of, of devoted prayer. And I asked them a question, the same question I'm, I'm going to ask you. And that is, if God were to answer every single one of your prayers that you prayed the last seven days, no, no questions, no, no negotiation, no compromise, just in one fell swoop, God answered every single prayer that you prayed the last seven days. Would anybody you be in the kingdom? What we pray about is what we prioritize. And God is driving at Jonah because Jonah was so bent out of shape about something he did not produce. And he didn't care about people. Now what about the church? When you study the story of the people of God, from the beginning and the creation of Israel through to the birth of the church to present. The purpose of the people of God has always been to be a light. In fact, the nation of Israel was never intended to be quarantined, secluded, segregated. It was intended to be a light unto the nations. And that included the Gentiles and the Samaritans and other folks that they didn't like. When God gave birth to the church, Jesus would use language like the church is a city on a hill. It is a light that you don't cover with a, a bushel or a basket. So what does this story of Jonah mean to the church? I, I believe just as Jonah ran from the calling of God, it, it is possible for entire churches to run from the calling of God. To forget that the church has been called to be the light of the world, the city on the hill. And our challenge in every generation, in every church, is do we value plants more than people? Do we value our way of doing things? Do we value our traditions more than people God created who don't know their left hand from their right hand? Churches that value plants more than people very quickly become inwardly biased. And they ask questions like, do I like this? Is this going to make me happy? Does this meet my need? How does this make me feel? And perhaps somewhere on the list is, will this reach a person who's far from God? The challenge of Jonah to the church is to be faithful to its calling. To be a place that exists for people who aren't here yet. For the people that we would make our list of those that we would not vote for and make a place for them. That's the challenge of Jonah. Is to be a church that's out there. Now, as you walked in this morning, you're handed a little small half sheet that this is actually at, at the welcome counter. Here's a very, very real, present, practical way the church, our church, has decided to make a dent in the darkness of Denver. And that is from our very beginning, 25 years ago, this is our anniversary year, by the way, we decided to change the spiritual landscape of South Denver by starting new churches and campuses. And we believe that what Denver deserves as a great city are great churches who are healthy and life-giving. 
And so we have made our goal, we made our passion and purpose to do that from the very beginning. Over the last five years, we've helped start new churches from Castle Rock to Erie. It's exciting. A couple months ago, I shared with you about a small church in England that has about 150, 200 people. And they had lost their senior pastor. We had been providing them with preaching support and some ministry support. And the conversation developed at the leadership level of could we be better together? Could they be better being adopted into Mountain View and being one church in two locations? And so we shared that with you. And we talked about that on and off. On this sheet is both a challenge and an opportunity. You'll notice on the back side, it's kind of hard to tell which is the back side, but it's the one with the web address on the bottom of that. We have prepared a place for you to go and to learn more about this opportunity. Got frequently asked questions. I don't know, 15, 18 of them are on there. And you can kind of read down what would this mean for them, for us, together. And you can read down through that to get better informed. But here's what we're asking you to do. We're asking you as our church family to pray and to fast about this decision. That we believe God works and answers the prayers of his people. And when God's people literally and figuratively empty themselves, that God fills them up. Just as we did a few years ago, when I stood right here and made a good case for why we were thinking of putting a bid in on the old Denver Christian property up on Dan Clark. And we said, we want you to take two weeks to pray and to fast about this. And in two weeks, we're going to collect your feedback. And we're going to see how the Lord has spoken. And I came back out. And if you remember that particular weekend, I said, we're going to do something very un-American. Eighty percent of you at that time were in favor of moving forward with Denver Christian. And at the elder level, we didn't feel God's peace with that. So we walked back out here and said, we're going to stay here. That's what I mean by un-American. So we're asking you to do the same this week. To pray fast. There's some suggestions on how to go about doing that if you've never fasted before. We're not asking for two weeks with no food. Uh, so there's some ways to do that on there and you'll see some, some very practical steps. But we believe that God speaks through the collective wisdom of his people. That the Holy Spirit still acts that we haven't gone on vacation. And so we want to pray and seek God's direction on this. They're doing the very same thing. And our elders will tell you that if we end up in two different places, and we say two different churches, and that is how God has directed it, that's the best thing. Absolutely. No regret? None. If God answers in two weeks and says we can be better together, that's what we want to do. And it's centered God's will. And so we're asking you to get involved. And for you to make this a priority of the next couple of weeks to pray, to fast, ask questions, Whatever it is that will help you find and seek God's direction. So that's your practical challenge this morning. If you didn't pick up one of our God Loves Denver magnets in the last couple of weeks, grab one and stick that up on your fridge or somewhere as a reminder that God loves Denver. As much as he loves Nineveh, as much as he loves Rome, that God loves our city.